The Mexican Revolution, which began in 1910 and continued for a decade, posed great challenges to the U.S. Fighting between various armed factions pushed hundreds of thousands of Mexicans into the American Southwest. In 1911, a coalition of Mexicans overthrew the long-serving dictator, Porfirio Diaz, who had welcomed foreign investors into the mining, oil, railroad, and agricultural sectors. His successor, a reformer named Francisco Madero, rattled these investors by questioning the validity of foreign-owned mineral resources and the large land holdings of the Catholic Church. Just as Wilson took office in 1913, one of Diaz's former generals, Victoriano Huerta, seized power and with what many Mexicans believed was the tacit approval of the U.S. ambassador, murdered Madero. Wilson, in fact, supported the goals of moderate reform in Mexico and was stunned by Madero's murder. He denounced Huerta as a butcher and undertook various efforts to drive him out and bring to power moderate reformers who would stabilize the country and cooperate with the U.S. Wilson's larger goal, he told friends, was to teach the South American republics to elect good men. In April 1914, as part of the effort to force Huerta from power and to prevent a shipment of German weapons from reaching him, Wilson ordered naval forces to occupy the city of Veracruz on the Gulf of Mexico. The fighting there killed 126 Mexicans and 19 Americans. A few months later, after Huerta fled Mexico, the path to power opened for Carranza, leader of the Reformist Constitutionalist Party. Although he was pleased to be rid of Huerta, Wilson found Carranza's talk of nationalizing foreign-owned land and mineral rights deeply disturbing, especially if Mexico served as a model for other developing Latin American countries. As a counter to Carranza, Wilson followed the advice of John Reed and backed another contender for power, General Francisco Pancho Villa. In spite of this assistance, Carranza's army defeated Villa and pushed his remaining forces north towards the U.S. border. After Wilson cut off aid to Villa and his men, they retaliated in March 1916 by attacking the town of Columbus, New Mexico, and killing 19 Americans. Villa went on to raid several other border towns between Arizona and Texas. He hoped, it seems, to provoke U.S. retaliation and then gain renewed popular support among Mexicans by resisting the Yankee invaders. Wilson, stung by critics who accused him of failing to defend American soil, dispatched nearly 12,000 troops under the command of General John J. Blackjack Pershing to subdue Villa. During the next nine months, Pershing futilely chased the bandit general deeper into Mexico. Eventually, American troops clashed with Mexican soldiers sent north by Carranza, who guessed that Pershing's hunt for Villa was actually a pretext to defend foreign oil leases against Mexican plans to nationalize them. German spies in Mexico, who witnessed the bungled campaign to catch Villa, assured Berlin that American soldiers would be ineffective if they fought in Europe. In July 1916, to avert a wider and unwanted war, Wilson and Carranza agreed to submit grievances to a joint commission. When it convened, Mexican officials demanded that foreign soldiers leave their country immediately. U.S. negotiators retorted that Pershing's troops would stay put until the government in Mexico City guaranteed the safety of foreign investments whose legality had been questioned by the recently drafted Mexican Constitution. Negotiations deadlocked in January 1917, at the same time as Germany decided to resume submarine attacks against American shipping. This new threat in the Atlantic overshadowed tensions with Mexico. Wilson soon withdrew U.S. troops and later extended full diplomatic recognition to Carranza's government. Nevertheless, U.S. relations with Mexico remained sour for the next 20 years. Although American leaders did not realize it at the time, the difficulty the U.S. experienced in trying to shape political development in Haiti and Mexico foreshadowed the much grander challenge that confronted Americans when they set out to reform the world between 1917 and 1919. By the end of 1916, the European conflict had become a total war. Nearly all able-bodied men had been drafted to replenish the ranks of the fallen. 
Most industrial production went to the war effort, and military commanders overshadowed civilian leaders. In Germany, for example, the military high command, rather than the weak civilian government, or even Kaiser Wilhelm, made all the key decisions. The German general staff feared that the British sea blockade would soon starve both troops and civilians, making it impossible to continue fighting. They hoped, however, that if the Navy unleashed its now-expanded submarine force of 120 U-boats against all merchant shipping in the Atlantic, they could starve Britain and France and initiate a win-the-ground-war offensive before the United States became much of a military factor in Europe. The plan carried grave risks, but presented the only chance for victory. On January 31, 1917, Germany informed the U.S. that it intended to order its U-boats to sink any American ships supplying the Allies. As part of their gamble, German strategists hoped to incite war between Mexico and the U.S. and thereby limit the Americans' ability to fight in Europe. In mid-January, as negotiations over the Pershing invasion became deadlocked, German Undersecretary for Foreign Affairs Arthur Zimmerman cabled instructions to the German ambassador in Mexico City. He was to propose to Carranza that if Mexico joined Germany in a war against the United States, a victorious Germany would return to Mexico the lost territories of Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona. Wisely, the Mexican government shunned the proposal. But British intelligence agents had intercepted the so-called Zimmerman telegram, held it for a month, then passed it to American officials in late February 1917, just as German U-boats were poised to resume their attacks on all shipping. Evidence of Germany's deceit outraged Americans. In Wilson's mind, Germany had become more than an aggressor and violator of neutral rights. It now directly threatened the United States, as well as world peace and democracy. A triumphant Germany, he feared, would dominate not only Europe, but also large parts of the British, French, Dutch, and Belgian empires. The U.S. could not prosper in a German-dominated world. Wilson ordered the arming of American merchant ships and awaited the inevitable U-boat attacks. In late March, German submarines sank five American ships, killing dozens of sailors and wounding many more. On April 2, 1917, Wilson asked Congress to declare war against the German autocracy and militarism that had unleashed what he described as unprovoked attacks on American lives and property. The U.S. would enter the war as an associated power rather than as a formal ally of Britain and France. This status, Wilson explained, would not bind him to honor secret deals made by the Allies to annex territory of the losing side. Most elected representatives, as well as a large majority of Americans, agreed that Germany posed a real threat to the nation. The president's vision of using the war as a tool to improve the world also enjoyed wide support. At home, some politicians such as Senator Lodge predicted that a nation unified by war would overcome festering race and class divisions. A few members of Congress, however, questioned the president's judgment. Progressive Republican senators such as Robert La Follette of Wisconsin and George Norris of Nebraska condemned Wilson as a dupe of British imperialism and Wall Street financiers. War, they cautioned, would kill reform at home. In the House, the first woman elected to Congress, Republican Janet Rankin of Montana, opposed the war as immoral. But these dissenters were ridiculed as, quote, treasonous by large majorities of their colleagues. On April 6th, 82 senators voted for war and just six against. In the House, the vote was 373 to 50.